Welcome to our study of business law. And we're going to begin this semester with a basic introduction into the field of law. We'll begin with defining what law is. And we hearken back to the words of Sir William Blackstone. And you might think, well, why do we worry about what this old guy said? And the answer to that is because it really illustrates how much of the law that we rely on in everyday society stems from centuries old, old English law. In fact, many of the cases that I read and studied about when I was preparing to take the bar exam were not from modern society, but were in fact centuries old cases. So uh, Sir William Blackstone defines the law as a rule of civil conduct commanding what is right and prohibiting what is wrong. What we'll deal with this semester in that context largely rate, relates to civil breaches that incur damages as opposed to criminal violations, which may, for example, result in a jail sentence. Um, we're not gonna talk about family law, patent law, probate law, um, all of those other areas of the law are certainly uh, interesting, but beyond the scope of what we'll be talking about here, with the exception of a little bit of criminal law, which we'll wade into uh, down the road a little bit. So what we're concerned about with is business, in business law is the nature of business transactions. And what we want is for there to be some sort of consistency and reliability in the business interactions that people have. It should be like, think of a choreographed dance where there are multiple dancers, but everybody knows their role so that people aren't bumping into each other. Civil laws are really designed for to create the roadmap so that people hopefully don't run into problems. And if they do, it defines the framework that we decide who's right and who's wrong. And as I mentioned before, the roots of our law largely um, reside in Old English law because as part of the, you know, the U.S. is where we have the 13 original colonies and all of those folks came from, at least that came over here, not the ones who were here anyway, but the ones who came here generally came from England. And so they brought with them many of the customs and laws that they had lived uh, with there. These customs gradually, again, became laws in our country. And that's how we ended up with many of the basics of our legal system uh, coming from English society. There's a concept in the law called equity. And equity, which is different than equality, equity assumes that there's an attempt to make things fair. And sometimes just giving somebody money isn't enough to level the playing field or to fix a problem. So there are different remedies potentially that are available and those give rise to things called restraining orders where we tell people they cannot do something, uh, they cannot go someplace, um, or injunctions that might prevent them from, for example, producing a product or engaging in a certain kind of advertising, for example. And those are equitable remedies as opposed to monetary damages. And we've got really two main sources of law it one stems from our constitution and we have both federal and state constitutions if you have not read your state constitution or frankly your federal constitution i encourage you to do that within your federal constitution we have the bill of rights and to say that something is a constitutional violation what we're really saying is that it violates your Bill of Rights, either federally or uh, from your state constitution. We also have statutes. Statutes are created by legislatures, 
by Congress. So whether it's, you know, and they could be even a local uh, if you had a municipality that was creating laws that would be applied within the community. And there are um, also uh, could be codes, uh, business codes, legal codes, things of that nature. And those are created by legislative bodies and they may change over time. Whereas our constitution is pretty much, well, it's not completely engraved in stone. To amend a constitution requires a, a really an, an upending uh, act of Congress to do that much more uh, rigorous than just changing a statute or, or a local law. Your text includes judicial decisions among the sources of law. And it's important to note that judges cannot make law. What judges are assigned to do is to interpret the law. So they look at your constitution, either federal or state, they look at statutes, and they interpret those and apply those to the facts of the case. But a judge cannot simply proclaim something a law. That responsibility is left to your elected officials, your congressmen or your legislators. Um, but there are uh, situations which are called precedents in which cases uh, with similar facts have come before the court and the court has interpreted how the law will apply to those sets of facts so that the next time a case with that set of facts comes before the court, uh, the court will apply the law in the same way as opposed to in a somewhat haphazard format. And those are called precedents. Now, a court is not compelled to apply a precedent unless that precedent is what's called binding precedent. A, a, there may be cases from other jurisdictions, other states, and I may like the way some other state treated the set of facts in my case. So I might say to a judge, hey judge, you know, Minnesota, they have a statute very similar to ours. And when they were confronted with this situation, this is how they treated it. And the judge might say, that's very interesting. Now, if there is not a source of binding precedent for my judge to follow, then my judge might be persuaded to use the analysis that was from another jurisdiction. However, under this concept called stare decisis, the, a judge may be bound to follow the precedent of its jurisdiction. And so there are three, under the concept of stare decisis, there are three sources of binding precedent for a court. That is the U.S. Supreme Court, which is the supreme authority, the highest circuit court in your circuit. So in New Hampshire, New Hampshire is part of the First Circuit, so they have the First Circuit Court of Appeals in Boston, and that is the highest appellate court on a federal level for the First Circuit. In Vermont, we have the Second Circuit. Second Circuit Court of Appeals is located down in New York City, and that is the highest federal appellate court for the Second Circuit. Now, each state is going to have its own Supreme Court. And for matters of state law, judges within those states are bound to follow the precedents set by the, the state Supreme Courts within their state. So just to recap, the three sources of binding authority for a court are the U.S. Supreme Court, the state Supreme Court in whatever state that case happens to be located, and the Circuit Court of Appeals for whatever circuit that state happens to be within. There is another source, and I, I before I move on, uh, that your slide points out, um, administrative uh, bodies and agencies um, also have some ability to do some sort of rulemaking, we'll call it, 
uh, for example, there might be uh, zoning ordinances that might be set, uh, things of that nature. And so there can be some administrative law as well that can be a source of law. So as I mentioned early on, not only do we have civil law, but we have criminal law, family law, probate law, all of those things. And so we're just going to very briefly touch on the difference between civil law and criminal law here. Civil law is concerned purely with private rights, disputes between two private individuals, whereas criminal law is concerned with offenses against the state. Now, you might say, well, you know, if, if somebody beats somebody else up, that's not the state, that there's a victim on the other end of that. Yes, you would be correct. Now, although the state will charge the offender under the state statute, the victim is not a party to that case. That, however, does not prevent the victim from going into civil court and suing the perpetrator for monetary damages as a result of maybe medical issues that were caused or pain and suffering, emotional distress, all of those kinds of things are civil cases. But the victim has no ability to prosecute someone criminally and cause somebody to have to go to jail. That power is reserved for the states. Now we have felony cases and misdemeanor cases. We also have lower level violation type things where you're talking about traffic tickets, things of that nature. A felony is generally punishable by more than a year in jail and a misdemeanor generally punishment by uh, a year or less, except in Vermont, you can have a misdemeanor up to two years in jail. Uh, anything more than two years in Vermont is considered a felony. There are offenses that they call them wobblers, uh, you know, and they can be uh, either uh, felonies or misdemeanors, and it may be um, uh, situations in which maybe the second offense becomes a felony, things of that nature. So it could be the very same conduct in two instances, but it may be that the second time or the third time that someone commits it, it now becomes a felony. And as I mentioned earlier, there are violations that are below misdemeanors. Those could be your, uh, your traffic cases, um, uh, you know, maybe a, um, somebody under 21 who is drinking might get a ticket for something like that. And those are often, uh, less serious than misdemeanor cases. So I think lawyers get a bad rap because uh, everybody thinks that we are, um, I don't know, out to trick the system, deceive people, but the law is based on ethics and lawyers have to abide by their code of conduct. And so as laws change, just as lawyers have ethics, society kind of has this overall moral code. And sometimes laws evolve based on society's moral code as a whole. And we will see things become law that in many years past, no one really considered a crime. Uh, I mean, think about the Wild West where you had bar fights, things like that. Um, it, you know, it's only as society became more evolved that things like that became criminal offenses. And so, you know, I think we've seen uh, an evolution in many areas of our society with the, the Me Too movement, things of that nature, where behaviors which were considered mm, appropriate or at least not offensive in a context of many years ago, as we have evolved morally as a society, we now look at those very same behaviors and apply very different meaning to that and potentially very different consequences for that. 
Now, as individuals in our society and as businesses, our ethics are often formed from a variety of sources, not just one. It could be our religious background, how we were raised, cultural background. It could be based on scientific knowledge. Um, and so there are all kinds of sources that um, mold ethical judgment. And someone who engages in merely an ethical breach may not necessarily uh, face a criminal consequence. However, when that ethical breach reaches a level that society has decided that that conduct should no longer be legal and the legislature has enacted laws to address that, our ethical conduct may also become illegal conduct. But by the same token, it doesn't mean that all unethical conduct violates laws. Um, and so, uh, as I said, we have evolved as a society ethically and that evolution has changed the way that lawmakers have decided to propose various bills. Now, as a business owner or manager in our world, uh, businesses have their own set of ethics. Professions have their own set of ethics, as I mentioned with lawyers and doctors and accountants and all of those things. And those are not laws. Although, if I do something unethical as a lawyer, I may find myself answering to my professional conduct board and my license may be in jeopardy. So I have to be mindful of not violating my ethical principles in the way that I practice. Businesses similarly have to weigh their own ethical principles about um, profits, for example, over uh, the environment would be, they, they may, choose to do things which are, are more profitable, but not necessarily the most environmentally beneficial choice, and that's a business ethics decision. On the other hand, a business could certainly choose to put the environment before profits, and that would signify their ethical values. But in either event, though, until the business reaches a point where ethics and the law collide, the ethical choices are left to the individual or individual businesses. Um, so as your slide points out in the long run, it is a good business practice to be ethical. It may not always be profitable in the moment, but uh, never bad business to put ethics before profits. And that is the end of chapter one.